Hey, podcast listeners, just a quick note about an upcoming free high tunnel workshop in November you might be interested in attending. For those listeners in Iowa and neighboring states, Iowa State University Extension is hosting its annual high tunnel short course on Monday, November 8th, 2021 from 830 until 330. Participants will hear experienced grower presenters talk about honing their winter growing systems, producing earlier summer fruits, and growing cut flowers and tunnels, as well as the latest research on cucumber grafting for increased production. Speaking this year are Liz Grisnick of Happy Hollow Farm in Missouri, John Dindia from Lakeview Hill Farm in Michigan, Ann and Eric Frasenberg from Pheasant Run Farm in Iowa, and Dr. Guan from Purdue University. It's free to attend, but registration is required by October 31st. Find the registration link at extension.iastate.edu forward slash vegetable lab or call Dan Phileas at 515-957-5760 for more info. They hope to see you there. Today's episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Growing for Market Magazine. Which crops will pay back your investment in a hoop house or greenhouse? How does managing a greenhouse through the winter differ from summer growing? And which crops can just be overwintered in the field? Learn all that and more by subscribing to Growing for Market Magazine. The writers are farmers, not journalists. They won't tell you how to grow. They'll tell you how they grow so you can decide what works for your farm. Growing for Market is celebrating 30 years of helping local food and flower growers succeed with articles written by experienced farmers from around North America. Since 1992, Growing for Market is by farmers for farmers. Plus, subscriptions start at only $30 per year. Whether you do farmers markets, local wholesaling, a CSA, or dream of starting a farm, check them out today at growingformarket.com. Request a free sample, print, or digital copy from their website, and podcast listeners can get a new subscriber discount of 25% off with the code WINTER when subscribing at growingformarket.com. I think Growing for Market Magazine is an excellent and affordable resource for any grower. Today's show is also brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. Johnny's Selected Seeds is a proud sponsor of the Winter Growers Podcast. Since 1973, Johnny's has supported farmers and gardeners with superior seeds, innovative tools, and pertinent information to help feed their families and communities and ensure their growing success. Our 40-acre research farm is the heart of Johnny's, where we trial thousands of varieties and tools every year. Our research team is dedicated to finding solutions to the ever-changing challenges growers face, including disease, environmental or insect pressures, and shifting market trends. We invite you to visit the Growers Library at johnnyseeds.com to find technical resources like the Winter Growing Guide, which has tips on planting and harvesting into the shortest days of the year. You can also find variety comparison charts, extensive Jang roller trial results, and more. The employee owners at Johnny's are working hard to make 2022 a great year, and we look forward to growing with you. Welcome to Season 2 of the Winter Growers Podcast. Today, my guest is Lydia Ryle of Cropthorn Farm in British Columbia, Canada. Located at the 49th parallel on an island near Vancouver, Lydia farms on a 50-acre family property she shares with her parents and her sister, Rachel. Managing 24 acres, 17 of which are in vegetable production, and the rest in annual cover crops, she markets a year-round CSA, three summer farmer's markets, one in winter, and an on-site farm stand that operates seasonally throughout the year. Her primary winter crops include kale, parsnip, spreading broccoli, and radicchio from the field, and a diversity of greens from the high tunnels. Using movable greenhouses, Lydia and her team are very effective at maximizing year-round production in the Pacific Northwest. Lydia brings a wealth of knowledge and wisdom to Four Season Farming, and I'm very excited to have her here on the podcast. I was recommended to get in touch with you by a listener from season one. So I'm really excited to talk with you about your operation, uh, especially being located in Canada and the fact that, you know, you're doing this year round near Vancouver. 
Um, you've been doing this for quite a long time. You farm with your family. There's so many great topics that I want to talk to you about. But first, I'd love to have you just tell us how you got started. Have you always known you have wanted to be a farmer? Kind of give us a little background. Definitely always wanted to be a farmer since I was a little kid. I knew that was the goal. Um, I come from a family farm. My parents had a 20-acre hydroponic greenhouse operation, so it is vastly different from uh, crop thorn. So that's that, that's what I grew up with. But in high school, I kind of had the sense that I wanted to have my hands in the soil, to be doing something smaller scale. So yeah, I went to university for agriculture out on the prairies. And then, uh, yeah, I came back to my parents' place and leased uh, a little part from them, about half an acre my, my first year. But yeah, no, this is, this is for me has always been, been the calling. So what was it like then growing up for you? Um, did your parents really involve you in the farming or, you know, how, how did it really sink in for you that you knew you wanted to farm? Yeah, their their farm was quite structured. They had over 100 employees, like it is very intensive. So uh, it, was, it was a lot more formal uh, than say like a, you know, a small, a small farm. But regardless, all of us kids were, were involved. Um, after university, I came back and I was their grower for, for a year just to see if I wanted to take over uh, their farm. But yeah, no, I, I always wanted to be outside, have my hands in the soil. Um, my parents had a big garden outside uh, when, when we were kids. So, and, and even at the supper table, we always talked about agriculture and, and, you know, my parents farm and you know the tomatoes that they grew, but also they were both quite active in the agriculture industry and uh, advocating. And so, you know, you'd hear about the neighbors and what was happening in the, in the area. So um, agriculture was always a big, a big part growing up. Yeah. And, and what was it like then going to Ag University? You know, that was a very specific educational tract. So what was that like for you? It was awesome. I really struggled in uh, elementary and high school. I have dyslexia and, you know, school is not easy. And so I think once I found my passion, I, you know, I could, I could run with it. And so, you know, you, you took a part of combine or, you know, you were AIing cows. And so like it was very hands-on. And to me, it was very useful information and it was great to be around people who had the same passion and like even it was you know it was conventional agriculture and this is this is on the prairies so I'm, I'm assuming similar to the I don't know, midwest of america like it was large acreage and so even though i'm farming very different from my friends who i met in college like the passion and the love for agriculture like that's there for for all of us and so it was it was a great time to be in college and to get away right to to get out of your hometown to go and learn um from other people it was it was a good time and then how did you sort of get specifically involved with organic uh, methods like that wasn't actually part of your uh schooling how did that grab onto you or what was your exposure to that yeah, in my fourth year, I took a environmental economics class, and uh, it was disheartening. Uh, and I think the pressure of being uh, some of the issues in the world around climate change. Uh, I just wanted to have a positive impact, and I didn't not a huge positive in, impact, but just to have a positive impact in my small place in the world. And to me, organic really fit that and so it was it was really about my values and yeah just taking care of the earth and I felt organics was a was a good way to do that. So you're outside of Vancouver uh, in British Columbia and when I looked up you're about the 49th parallel is that correct? Yeah so we're about uh, 15 minutes from the uh, the American border. Okay um, and about zo- like a zone eight zone seven eight yeah, we'd be zone eight. So we are right on the ocean. So we're 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 a little island at the mouth of the Fraser River. So the Salish Sea is is right there. So um, we are relatively mild, even compared to say an hour or two from here. We we don't get snow in the or we sorry we rarely get snow in the winter. You know, for for a week or so. Uh, for us, we only go down to 
minus seven Celsius for a week or two, but we're, you know, we're, we're above zero Celsius for most of the winter. Wow. That for, for a Maine farmer, that sounds like heaven, (laughs) (laughs) but I know you have your own challenges too, but with, uh, with probably winter growing, but yeah, that sounds quite lovely temperature wise. (laughs) So describe a little bit more kind of the, the lay of the land, the farm itself, uh, how large, uh, yeah, may, I know you, this was, this is a family property. So maybe just describe a little bit more about um, how that happened. Yeah. So my sister, Rachel worked with me at crop store, at crop store in the first few years. So we started with like half an acre at my parents' place and grew to about three acres at uh, my parents' farm. They kind of realized none of us three kids, I have a brother as well, um, but none of us wanted to take over their farm as it was and so they sold it and they bought this property about 10 minutes from the the old farm 50 acres with their intention of of slowing down um and rachel and i kind of uh, ramping up crop zorn and so we started here with about 10 acres and we're now at 17 um, acres of vegetables and uh, we do about another seven acres of annual cover crop so I managed about 24 acres about five years ago I guess Rachel spun off to start river and sea flowers um, a certified organic cut flower farm that's also on the on the property so she does about an acre and a half of cut flowers and then my parents did a little bit of grain they now have about 200 layer hens that they sell through crop thorn or my farm. And uh, so, yeah, we have kind of three, three different operations, all different scales doing different things. So yeah, all, all working together on the 50 acres. And when you started out, did you, you started out smaller, did you always have the goal to grow bigger and become more mechanized? Kind of what was your progress or process with that? This is not necessarily the right answer, but I had no goal, no plan. I had no business plan. I had absolutely nothing when I started. It was like pure passion and just seeing where it could go. I think I was 23 at the time. And so, you know, your first season, yeah, there wasn't a lot of thought involved. It was just doing it and it kind of just spiraled and spiraled and spiraled. So I think when we have like, tours out at the farm and there's professors and I tell them that I didn't have a business plan. I think they usually cringe at that. And I think it's super important to have, but for me, it was just slowly growing year, year by year. So to get to the point where we're at, it totally just happened naturally. Um, I never thought that we would be at the acreage where we're at, but now that we are where we're at, I really like the acres. We're at 17 acres of veggies, and I find that's like a really nice balance of mechanization. And also, uh, still, there's like a human scale to it. So we're not, there's no big plans to do any uh, more expansion veggie-wise. What were some of the deciding factors to become mechanized as opposed to staying sort of more, you know, small scale I think one is I I do love being on the tractor. I find that is a really nice time for me. It's a nice quiet time. And so I like, I've always liked being on the tractor, just personal preference there, but also just being easier on the body, you know, walk behind can be, can be tough uh, tractors. And so to mechanize, it's just, you know, we want, I want to be doing this for the long run. Uh, And so if we can mechanize and make it easier on the body, then I think that's a big win. Yeah. And sounds like you have some pretty amazing farmland um, in that area too, right? You have, I've seen photos and it's like flat and level and no rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so I would imagine that allows you to, you know, have the option to expand to that level too. Absolutely. I, I don't know. This is class one. I don't know uh, if, if you guys have the same classification um, down south, but yeah, it's like, you know, the best soil there is, you know, so we're in a fertile valley and there it is absolutely we're at we're at sea level though we are we're the island we're on is dyke you know so that's a concern uh in terms of climate change but yeah we are exactly at sea level uh it is flat it's wonderful we definitely have some challenges with with winter growing given the moisture both in the the rainfall that we have on the uh coast and also we have relatively it's a clay loam so the, the soil is quite saturated and in the spring, you know, it's warm enough for us to get on the field, but, you know, there's puddles. So we can't get on usually until mid-April, even though, you know, the frost, you know, hasn't happened uh, in, in a while. Um, 
it's just so wet. So we, we, we have our challenges, but this is like a, a lovely place to be farming. So how do you, how are you managing your soils and your fertility, especially growing year round? What's your process look like? So we were doing a lot more cover cropping. Our, our biggest struggle uh, with cover cropping though, is we're on the Pacific flyway. So we have, you know, thousands and thousands of snow geese and ducks and other migratory birds that either pass through here or will winter here. And if we don't get a cover crop knee high by early September, it's just mowed down all winter. So we want to be uh, using cover crops as fertility, but if those cover crops aren't tall enough, there's nothing there come spring. So it's a little challenging. Um, uh, we are using compost on the farm for fertility as well. We don't use too many granules other than you know, the odd micro. But the goal is to be doing cover crops. And that's why we're, we yeah, have seven acres of annual cover crop that we focus on having uh, things tall enough that it can withstand the, the snow geese and ducks. So in the winter, what, what percentage of those fields are in um, production or, you know, being wintered over with crops to harvest? Four, three. Yeah, not, not, not a huge amount. We have, the, we have four high tunnels as well. So, yeah, kind of a mix between outdoors and four high tunnels for winter growing. So, uh, so you, you're warm enough to be able to have some field crops, but because of the challenges with your wet, heavy clay soils, it's harder to do a lot of outdoor production or how does that work out there for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, yeah, the soil just gets saturated and waterlogged. We have drain tile underneath to try to, to move that water out. We have a pump to, to pump it off the farm, but it can de- it's definitely a challenge. And it's also, you know, we could probably do more winter growing, but it's a lot of work to be growing year round. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. uh, we're, we're, <laughs> you know, it's not like we stop in the summer. And so, uh, you know, we're happy at the scale we're at in terms of winter growing and we're all trying more things, but it can get disheartening. You know, our purple sprouting broccoli crop this year, uh, was just mowed down overnight by widgeon and what, you know, type of duck. And so, you know, this year it's like, you know, we bought, now we bought netting because we don't want to put row cover on because we want to make sure there's ventilation and, um, you know, it's not going to rot by having row cover on it like constantly all winter. And so, okay, can we do netting instead? And so there's challenges. So we're trying to finesse these things. And then we do, we do get cold. So we, ha- we have a, a decent amount of uh, radicchio uh, outside in the winter. We just have to watch that if it does get cold, is okay, are we putting cover on it or will we totally lose it? So winter growing doesn't guarantee 100% harvest. And so I don't want to go too big into it out in the field because every year is so different in terms of waterfowl pressure, in terms of temperature, that sometimes the cost is, is too great. What then are your kind of guaranteed outdoor winter crops? We'll get into high tunnels in a sec, but what are the, the ones you can depend on? Yeah, so uh, kale, um, we have got in a good, in a warmer year, uh, chard, we leave the parsnips in the ground. Purple sprouting, you know, four out of five years is, is good. We, some, we have about a 50% chance on overwintering cauliflower. Radicchio is definitely a big one that we've been doing more. Leeks, love leeks in the winter. They're super hardy. Uh, they clean up so beautifully. So that's all a nice one. Yeah, I'm I'm jealous you can do leeks outside of a high tunnel. <laughs> we're we're limited to you know one twenty two by forty eight high tunnel for leeks, and even that's kind of you know pushing it for the space. So that that sounds like such a luxury to have outdoor leeks. <laughs> So then let's move into the high tunnels. You have four high tunnels. What are the sizes of those and how, how do you break those down? We have one is kind of our propagation house in the summer. So we, we two, two have heat um, and heat in the sense that we're just keeping it above freezing in the winter months. Um, and one will, will heat a little bit for, for propagation. Uh, so one is a hundred times 35 feet. Another is uh, so I guess 2,800 square feet, 1,800 square feet, 3,500 square feet, and we just had a, a a big our biggest one. I don't even know what the square footage is anymore. Uh, 35 by 250. So it's we've extended that one so it's longer. So 
two of them, as I said, are heated. Um, the third one also has two layers of poly. And then our, our really small one uh, is single layer. It's quite a small house. But that one, we have two that are on, uh, on the rail system that are movable, which is great for season extension. Two of them are quite automated with roof vents and, you know, computers and things like that. And the other ones are a little less so. So this is sort of my my favorite question to ask all winter growers is how do you manage the complicated dance of crop transitions in the high tunnels going from summer to fall to winter to spring and all over again? I know you have those two movables, so that makes it a lot easier. But how do you how do you organize all that? Yeah, it always needs improving. Uh, it's yeah, it's as you said, it's it's a juggle. Um, there's competing needs that are that are always a struggle to figure out. You know, it's heartbreaking to rip out a tomato crop that's still producing, but you know you need to do it because you got to get that spinach in the ground by a certain date. So it's never fun. Those the, and I, it's more so the fall. The spring's not as gut wrenching, I guess. But I think the biggest thing is we have more space now. We did this uh, this add on. And that is just allowing us so much more flexibility so that we can have some early spring crops and still have our, you know, cucumbers and tomatoes in, in the spring, the rolling greenhouses. Yeah. Are, are fantastic for, for that. So for me, the more space is the better to kind of win it all out, but it's, we have absolutely no perfect recipe and I feel like it changes every year. <laughs> So w- talk me through um, one of the movables, uh, you know, through a year. Yes. I guess so. Th- this time of year, uh, we ha- where the greenhouse is, the high tunnel is, is tomatoes that were planted in late April. And the tomatoes will be there until, say, the last week of September. But in the footprint, Beside that, in mid-September, we'll plant some greens, so some sat soy, maybe some radishes, and bok choy um, outside. And then kind of when the weather turns, usually before the big next dump of rain, kind of the end of September, early October, uh, we'll roll the greenhouse onto that, and it will stay there all winter. And uh, by January, we're going to be done uh, harvesting all those crops and then we're broad forking it getting it ready and the goal is always late february but it ends up being mid-march that we're seeding uh, carrots in the high tunnel and then that high tunnel gets moved off for the tomatoes late april so it allows us to have that early carrot crop so kind of it, it's always carrots in the spring winter greens in the winter and then tomatoes or melons in, in the high tunnel for the summer months for those two movables. Great. So that, that ends up being two moves then uh, for that high tunnel per within that cycle, yeah. right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And you said they're on rails. So I'm assuming you're, are you pulling those with a tractor? What's, what's their style for moving? People. Oh, yeah. okay. Are, are these, are little... <laughs> yeah, tell me what are the, what's the design, the model? <laughs> it's a, it's, Harnois, uh, they're they're Harnois, the the company that made them. So uh, the 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 smaller one, four people can move it relatively easy. Okay. Uh, the one that's eighty feet requires six people. They're twenty five, thirty five feet wide, so it's not super easy. Uh, but we we don't winch them with a tractor. Uh, we find it's just it's easy enough with the. Uh, with people to move them. And this is a Harnois that was a retrofitted with the rails because uh, I'm assuming they didn't make it that way. Correct. Yes, this is not. Uh, yes. So this is what we, we did after the fact. Great. Great. Okay. So good. Well, it's great to hear other farmers, you know, being creative and making movables from what they have, because obviously there's not many commercial options out there. So that's really great to hear that. Yeah, it was it was a fun thing to do at the time, and I think we learned a lot. I think uh, it was like ten years ago that we did them, so we probably do it a little differently than we did, but it's worked. And uh, almost wish we had more of these movable ones. We also get high winds in the winter, so uh, you know it's always a worry. The more high tunnels you have, eventually one's gonna rip off or do something. So right now, I'm kind of content with the with the ones we have, but I, I love the versatility of the movable ones. Yeah. And what's your anchoring then? You speak of winds. How do you anchor them? Because I guess they're called earth screws, earth anchors, just those and turnbuckles. Um, and it's a, each corner? 
Oh, we have one at every, we have one almost at every trust. Okay. So like, you, yeah. So yeah. No. Going serious. <laughs> I, I like to sleep at night, you know. So <laughs> if the, the, yeah, I, I, they really shouldn't move. I mean, these things anchor down, you know, grain bins out in the prairies. So yeah, uh, we should be we should be good. Um, yeah, it's more likely we lose the polys. Yeah, no issues in the last ten years. So you you seem to have a good track record, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I know that's always one of the concerns and questions that a lot of people have about movables. Uh, so are you, are you prepping those greenhouses with tractors by hand? How do you, how are you managing the soil in there? So we've kind of, we cha- kind of changed it a little bit. We used to be a very high tilling, tilling all the time. Doesn't matter if we were tilling or if we were going to be planting transplants or direct seeding, we would have like a nice fluffy tilled bed. We are trying to move away from such aggressive tilling out in the fields we can rotate um, and have cover crop um, and and kind of rehab um, and strengthen the soil out in the field but in the greenhouse it's so intensively grown that uh, we want to keep the the life and uh, all the magic and the soil structure there and so trying to reduce tillage in there so when we are planting tomatoes and cukes anything in a transplant we are actually just working it by hand. We're broad forking it. But uh, in the fall, if we are direct feeding spinach or salad greens, we are going in with a tractor, a small, a small tractor and rototilling. So we, we don't have a walk behind. Uh, the greenhouses are big enough that we can kind of move around in them. The one nice thing is uh, like this year we have cover crop in our greenhouse so that we can get some more organic matter back in there. Uh, so we have about... 3,500 square feet of, of cover crop. And that's, that's exciting because most of our demand for the high tunnels is not so much in the summer uh, with the cukes and tomatoes. It's more so for the winter time, the winter growing. So in the summer this year, we're, we're putting two, two reps of cover crop to, to help put some more organic matter and hopefully get some more earthworms in there. Hopefully reducing tillage as much as we can going forward. Yeah. Well, um, I know you can do this so many different ways, and obviously it's the power of observation uh, of your soils is really, to me, what seems the most important, how they're performing. So so it's always always a work in progress, tilling, no tilling, <laughs> everything in between. Right. Reduced. Reduced. Reduced, reduced tilling. Want, right. right. I- yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, with 17 acres, you know, in production and those high tunnels, you – must have a lot of produce. Tell me about your markets and your marketing. What what are the outlets? So uh, we do CSA. Uh, so we kind of have three different seasons. Our summer season is June till late October. We have 300 uh, shares um, that pick up either at the farm or at farmer's markets. Uh, we have a early winter one, November and December. And then we have a bi-weekly one where, where it's totally customizable. The early winter and summer, it's farmer's choice in terms of what's in the box. But January till May, as long as they hit $30 worth of veggies, they can pick whatever they want just so they have that ability. We have less supply or less choice that time of year, so it kind of gives them that option. And in the wintertime, our CSA is more like 150, so half of what it is in the summer. And then we do farmer's markets. We do three in the summer and then one all throughout the winter. So there's only one week of the year, typically, that we don't do a farmer's market. And we do restaurant sales as well. And uh, we have a farm stand. So our little island we live on, there's a bit of agritourism. There's uh, you pick berries and there's a bird sanctuary. And you know, we're about a half hour, 45 minute drive from Vancouver. So we have a farm stand here that, that's grown the last few years. So yeah, everything we do is, is direct. And, and those farmer's markets, are those all in Vancouver? Are you traveling there for those? Yes. So everything is in Vancouver and in, in the morning without the traffic, it's only about 35, 45 minutes to get to, to the city. And do you, since you've opened that farm stand, do you feel that you can increase your traffic out there and do less traveling to farmer's markets? Or is that always going to be part of your, your marketing? <laughs> that is the long-term plan for sure. And we, and we have dropped one additional market over the years. I would I would love to do at least one less farmers market in the summer, 
and and to continue the growth of the farm stand. It uh, it's less of a headache. It's great to get people out here. In terms of business plan, I now I guess have a business plan where <laughs> we will drop markets. <laughs> but, uh, don't don't have a date yet, but yeah, it's, it's been it's great to get people out here and to get out to the farms and for people to see it and to to learn about farming and the uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's a lot to to manage. So talk to me about employees and how many employees you have and year round, seasonal, all that. Yeah. So with that, you know, to get to the acres we have, it's you know, we've gone from, you know, one employee into now. So our our field crew is about ten uh in the in the high season. And then we also have farm stand and farmers market. So we have a few additional staff that do more of the selling side of things. So about 15, like on a busy day, we could have, yeah, 13 people in the pack house. And we have about six or so uh, year-round employees, like full-time, year-round. And probably about four years ago, we could have had three employees. But our winter growing has definitely increased that we we need more of a, a winter crew. And then we have uh, half of our crew is seasonal, and they come back each year the seasonal agriculture worker program up here. Uh, So we have five guys that come from Mexico each season, kind of from April until October, sometimes December that come up that are a huge part of our our field team as well. Is that, is that similar to uh, an H2A program that we have in the U S? Yes, it would be. Yep. And how many, you started that how many years ago? And I mean, it seems like a wonderful thing for continuity for the farm to have returning people who know the farm. So how long has that gone on for? This, I believe, is year six with that. And before that, it was always a bit of a, you know, it'd be January or February. And I'd always be worried about what our summer labor situation was going to look like. So we tried it out. And it's been great that we have the crew come back each year. They're so skilled and it's allowed the farm to grow. I think we were kind of at about nine, 10 acres and you know now we're at 17 of, of veggies and having that supply of labor has been so critical. And it's been great to learn from them on, on harvesting. Um, it's been a really positive for our farm to have the crew. And I, I don't know what it's like in the States, but uh, you know, you, you hear stories that sometimes these, these aren't the best programs, um, So sometimes it's hard, I guess, to be part of those programs that you hear about mistreatment of workers and things like that. It's, it's tough. It's not, it's not a perfect thing. The the five guys that we have, they all have children that live in Mexico, that they're away from their families. And so that is, as a parent, that's really tough. So it's, it's, while it provides us that labor, it's, it's not a perfect program. They don't have a way to become Canadian citizens at this point. And so it fits the need right now. But I feel like there, there's definitely some reform that still needs to happen for this program because they're such a huge part of our farm and farms all over. Uh, you know, they're the people that, that, that pick the majority of the food uh, in, in North America. And uh, I think we can do more for them. Yeah, definitely. I, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> a complicated issue, though, on so many levels, but definitely worth having conversations about moving forward. So, hey, podcast listeners, we're going to pause for a moment to hear from one of our show sponsors. Today's show is also brought to you by Tunnel Vision Hoops. Tunnel Vision Hoops designs and manufactures do it yourself high tunnels, hoop houses, and greenhouses. With an extensive array of products to help large and small growers become more productive, they have 11 different tunnel widths to fit any application and designs to stand up to weather conditions from coast to coast. Tunnel Vision is also a national distributor of parts and accessories needed to build, maintain, or upgrade an existing tunnel or hoop house. Check out their Tunnel Vision Hoops YouTube channel for instructional how-to videos to help build a great high tunnel or hoop house. Here at Four Season Farm, we have two movable high tunnels made by Tunnel Vision Hoops, and they are definitely my favorites. To learn more, visit their website at tunnelvisionhoops.com. Now, back to the show. You brought up, you know, as a parent, you are a mom, and I think I've heard you mention that that is becoming a parent, being a mom has made you a better farmer. 
<laughs> how, how uh, explain that, describe that. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing was letting go. It really forced me to step back and let other, uh, you know, let our crew take the reins. And I could see the farm not by being in it all the time, but sometimes, you know, being out of it and having a different view. But I think the biggest thing is that before I met my partner, I'd be working seven days a week, 16 hour days. And when I met David, you know, I had to reduce my hours. So I'd spend time with him and uh, having kids, you know, reduce that even further. This year, I'm going to have two days off in a row. And of course, they won't be total days off. There's always something to do, but I'm not going to be doing a weekend farmer's market. You know, I have a five year old and a two year old. And Everyone should have a few days off, two days off or a day and a half off. Seems crazy to have gone this this long with with only like a half day off for so many years. So they've just allowed me to or they forced me to to step back and reduce my hours. But now we have an assistant manager and we have a, a, a field lead and a post harvest lead and all these people want to step up and have such great ideas that it really by me having reducing my hours is by far strengthened the farm and it's not not all up to me that if I'm sick or if I can't do something that someone else is quite capable so I think it was a little bit scary to take that leap uh, when we had our daughter not knowing what it was going to to be like but it's yeah it's by far brought the farm out stronger and and better yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, a defining moment for, you know, sort of a farm owner, farm entrepreneur to suddenly realize one day that the farm actually doesn't really revolve around them. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that you can ask for help, <laughs> that that you can actually step away, that, you know, the farm's not going to fall apart just if you're not always involved in every single detail. And and that's a hard moment. <laughs> Absolutely. And also the fact that there's, there's more than the farm, right? Yeah. It's when you're, when you're in it, you're, you're in it and you don't see anything else and you can, you can love farming so much. Uh, and, and, the, and for me, like, I, I hope to be farming the rest of my life. I, I do think this is where I'm supposed to be, but if one day this isn't working for me for whatever reason, I want to be able to walk away you know, that I have a life outside of, of the farm for somebody who was a workaholic, having kids has, has allowed me to have a bit of a life outside the farm. So it seems totally counterintuitive <laughs> that having kids would make life easier. But, uh, yeah, it, it def- definitely has. Yeah. So, so then what does um, self-care look like for you and your family and time off and time away? Have you been able to sort of incorporate that into your, your farm life? Yes, I still struggle with self care. I, I yeah have not have not mastered it. I'm hoping this year by having you know two days off or a day and a half. Off. Has anyone mastered self care? <laughs> Let me just yeah. call that out first. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And maybe if you're um, a monk. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I hope that I have more time because, you know, at this point, you know, you have one day off and you're doing chores and you're trying to hang out with the kids. But in terms of like chilling out, reading a book or letting your mind wander, I find that um, that it, that is a struggle. But in terms of a family, we take a week off the end of August each year. It's, we, we, we book it in January. We know we're doing it. Um, the dates might shuffle around, but we know that we're, we're off for 10 days or a, a week as a family. We also, you know, we, we love where we live. So sometimes it's just, you know, walking around the farm with the kids. And, and sometimes that self-care is being on a tractor on a Saturday, uh, having that time to oneself, being productive, but not having the pulls of like the whole farm crew being around sometimes it's a nice time to let the let the mind wander um I, I by far do not have the answers but as you know I'm 30 I'm, I'm 36 this year and uh it's something that needs to be there it's something that I talk to the crew about 
because a lot of our crew want to want to have their own farm one day and I don't, I don't want them to burn out. Um, I've, I've seen it. I've almost been there. And I, yeah, I, I, it's that sense of, you know, leading, leading by example. Yeah, no, it, it, um, it definitely needs to be talked about more. And, and for some reason, I, you know, it, the culture of farming has, it's been hard to really bring that up, but I'm glad more and more people are, are being more open about it. So that's a good thing. And it's a work in progress. I mean, no, I don't think anyone's got all the answers. I think it's everyone's figuring it out as they go. Just being mindful of it is the most important thing. Yeah, and I think for me, I grew up with my 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 dad. You know, my parents were farming full time. It was you know, quite intensive, and my dad took a, a summer off. You know, things became too much for him. He was in his early forties. Even now, to think that you know you can take a summer off if that's what you need. Like I've, I've seen that and you know, my parents' farm continued and it was for the better. That example being in the, in the back of my head is, is, is always there that if things become too much, it's okay to step back. There's yeah. As I said, there's cultivating a life outside of the farm is, is what strengthens it all. So you bring up family. I'm, I'm really curious to, to learn about your experiences farming with your family. It's, you know, you I think I read your third generation, maybe more, um, a farmer. And so it's been in your family a long time and it comes with, as I know firsthand, tremendous blessings, but also a lot of challenges too. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about your lessons learned in that experience. Yeah. Still, still learning. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I think on one, one side with my parents, they, I guess one blessing is that I didn't take over their farm. Crop thorn is a lot different from uh, my parents' farm, but there's always that pressure. They, they, they were well known and they did a really good job of growing tomatoes. And so there's that, that pressure, that legacy pressure I'm quite similar to my dad, but I'm also not my dad. And he's, he's a perfectionist and he, he's, you know, one of those people that are rarely wrong. He, you know, almost always does things right. And uh, that can be a lot of pressure and uh, maybe, maybe, you know, um, <laughs> and it, uh, so sometimes it's just breaking out to be your own person and to do things differently than your parents is, is okay. And I also think navigating that relationship of times where both my parents are mentors. I meet my dad weekly, mostly to talk about the high tunnels and just some infrastructure things on the farm um, that helps me out with. And my mom actually works for my farm. She does the I'm lucky that she does the books and payroll and, and admin side of things. So I, I see them on a the daily basis. And, you know, there's that gray area where there's times where we are, uh, colleagues in a sense or um, business partners or I guess in my I guess my my mom's employer in a sense like so there's there's this business side of things but there's also that these are my parents and and sometimes I need my parents to be my parents not my advisor and you know there's times where we you know if we're having a barbecue we're, we don't need to talk about work let's talk about other things so it's, it's learning to communicate and when to communicate. You know, if we're at a, a supper, we don't need to bring up like a, a heavy work conversation. We can save that for another time. And it's, it's taken time to to get there and to learn how to communicate. So I'm super grateful for them. They have so much knowledge. Uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate that they are here to mentor me. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not always a, an easy relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it. I've learned it's just takes a lot of boundaries and, and boundaries that you didn't even realize that you had to have. <laughs> so that, you know, the, the, di the differences between the professional and the familial, those relationships, like you said, there's so many gray areas and it's, it's difficult to navigate those, especially when you're busy and stressed and, um, you know, always around each other, right? There's, it's hard to get a lot of space. Um, yeah. I'm curious if you brought in anyone to sort of help with, with that uh, process to, of communication you mentioned? Yeah, we have, so, you know, we have three businesses here. So there's my sister as well. And sometimes we have, my sister and I haven't always had the, the best relationship. And I think one thing we sometimes do is triangle my parents into conversations uh, that put them in these awkward positions of like choosing 
whose idea is better or choosing which one. And so, uh, you know, I'm learning to, to not have to bring, you know, our parents in who aren't going to choose between their two daughters on something. Uh, so leaving them out of it. Uh, so we have, we have brought in, um, professional before to, for family meetings that were helpful and, and hopefully actually again it's critical for that communication uh you know we want to be farming for a long long time and you know if we're all living on the farm we want to get along with each other too and, and for the most part we do it's just it's hard to have those hard conversations and sometimes it's better to have a professional in to have it structured so i'm absolutely all for bringing a third party in and and helping facilitate those hard conversations. Yeah, no, definitely. With the farmer movement these days, I mean, a lot of farmers are, you know, first generation, but obviously they're having children and we hope (laughs) that their children are going to want to farm as well. So learning early on how to navigate those relationships is so important. So it's kudos to you for being intentional about that with your family. Yeah, (laughs) as I said, always, always a work in progress. I also don't want to forget, as you know, as, as as hard as it can be, there is so much beauty and wonderful things about being a multi generational farm by having grandparents around, even for simple things like childcare, but also being around and seeing my parents age and seeing them working but aging, and and like I, I get on really well with my parents. Yeah, it's it's an absolutely great thing. So yes, there's challenges that I seem to think about a lot more and you kind of forget about the the beauty of having different people and having my kids being around their cousins all the time. Uh, it's, it's by far a lot more positive than it is negative. And I think as a family, we just really need to focus on, on, on the positive a lot more. Yeah. It also seems like how you have these separate enterprises that have a level of, you know, autonomy and ownership to them seems really important too, because then everyone has the opportunity to shine on, you know, as, as them in those enterprises, as opposed to sort of feeling like they have to fit themselves into someone else's. So, yeah, well, I guess I know you said, you know, when we started the conversation that when you started out, you didn't necessarily have a business plan. I guess now my question to you would be, where do you see the farm in five years? <laughs> um, are are you still kind of of the mindset of letting things happen? Or do you feel like you want to be more? I'm just curious, like, do you have visions of the farm? Or are you just happy to kind of take things day by day? I guess I'd say like a, a 10 year plan. <laughs> I, we started, we, we started trialing like dry beans. I'd love to have more livestock incorporated onto the farm for for fertility, but also, you know, thinking of the idea of like a, a not necessarily a whole food CSA, but you know, having having more options available for our our, our members. So, I, like, I don't know what that looks like yet. I'd, I'd say is I'd like to wait until my kids are at least into school a little bit to get to that next step, but. You know, my kids are young, so I, we're not going to do anything big. I, I'd say for the for the next ten years, we might expand our farm stand in a few years, but for the most part, I want not too many changes. I want this to be the status quo, so that I can enjoy the family time and not have the pressure of expansion, whether that's investment money wise or just a huge big project that seems overwhelming. I want more of the focus to be on finessing what we're doing it's really hard to master when you're growing 50 different crops it's in so many different varieties it's hard to master the growing and we're not there yet in terms of mastering it and you know are we ever going to get there I, you know but i so for me is like really finessing the systems we have in place that's the goal of the next 5 years is finessing the systems and for me, the other goal, and it always is the other goal, is growing farmers. We have had quite a few of our crew go on to start their own farm, and that's what gets me really excited. So kind of continuing that process of, of mentorship of people who are either working here now or, you know, I talk once a week to uh, someone who worked for us who just started their own farm. So that's kind of where I see the the farm 
going is, is not, I guess, not too far quite yet. Yeah, no, that sounds all very um, smart and <laughs> pragmatic and everything. So I, I think that's a great, great plan. And and also, I'm, I'm assuming you want to, you know, I don't, you may not necessarily expand, but keep the winter growing as a primary focus too. Absolutely. Like I, it's super fun. It's, we, you know, we have friends in California and, you know, talking of water supply issues and, and in a sense, you know, this past year and a bit with, with COVID with borders being closed, of course, the food, you know, kept coming. Uh, but in the winter in Canada, we rely quite a bit on produce from Mexico and uh, California and Arizona. And I think for some people that was a bit of a wake up call in terms of what if, what if, I guess, in terms of climate change, um, but also in terms of, you know, ever the possibility of borders actually closing and not having access to this. And we, we're not at a grocery store we're a production scale. Uh, so this is a bit of dreaming here. Um, but if we can grow more winter greens and if we can get more people, more other farms growing in the wintertime to at least have a little bit more of our own uh, local produce in the winter, like, let's do it. That, it's a fun time of year to push the boundaries. Well, good. No, that sounds great. Uh, it, it's wonderful how much I've learned from this conversation. It, I'm so glad uh, that you've been so open and sharing. I think we're ready for our lightning round, if you're ready. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So number one, uh, favorite crop to grow, cook, or eat? Fennel. Why? <laughs> I got to know why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it washes up so beautifully in the fall. It's, you, know, you can get like a two pound fennel and uh, <laughs> it's just the, the, the color contrast. Uh, you, know, you can caramelize it on pizza, so it's always been kind of a, a a a favorite veg of mine. And it's like for us, it's like relatively pest free. You know, we have a bit of issues with summertime bolting, but in the fall, it's just like this primo beautiful crop. Okay, what gets you up in the morning? Uh, realistically, my children or or the rooster. That is, the rooster's about a hundred feet from my bedroom window. Um, but but like it's mostly my crew. My crew pushes me to do better. They're so enthusiastic about new ideas and pushing forward that like I want to show up for them. Uh, so I feel the pressure and, and like a good pressure of showing up, being a, a, a good manager and giving them opportunities. But yeah, that's kind of what gets me going these days. What's the hardest part of farming? Learning when enough is enough, when to call it quits, I guess in all sorts of ways, I guess in terms of the end of the day, right? This, you know, like last, last Monday, uh, we were going to get some rain on the Tuesday. It was five fifteen. It was my daughter's birthday. The neighbors just dropped by to drop off a present. And, uh, you know, I had to get on the tractor in that moment. It did make sense because, you know, it was a few more days till things were dried out. So it did make sense to, to make that call. But other times, if it wasn't going to rain the next day, I can do it tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's that, you know, the, the list is never ending of the to-do list. And it's knowing when, knowing when to either cut it completely, move it to the next day, saying no, all those, all those boundary things is the toughest thing, I think. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, what's your favorite music you listen to while farming? I mean, I'm a big fan of Leonard Cohen, Tragically Hip. But when I'm on the tractor, it's usually our public broadcast or CBC. Uh, I guess that's probably similar to maybe NPR. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it just it's it, it mostly talk. Sometimes there's two stations, you know, you'll get like choral music in the morning, which is nice to chill. You know, just a big diversity or else it's conversations, whether it's like just things that are happening around the world. And it's, you know, we can get kind of isolated out on the farm and you can get so into just this farming life, but there's a whole world out there and other people are living totally different experiences than me. And it's, it's nice to have that radio connection to see what else is going on in the world. So yeah, usually it's, it's just whatever's, whatever's on our, our, our radio station. What's one piece of advice you wish you had starting out or something you wish you'd done differently? I think enjoying being in the moment, you know, the first few years was such a struggle and it was 
such long hours, but there was like excitement. Like you built a chicken coop or you put up the greenhouse by yourself or well, I mean, with your friends that, you know, you weren't built like now our greenhouses are big where, you know, we have a, someone puts them up for us. And so it's kind of enjoying where you are at the time. Cause you don't, you never know what the next step is. And it was a lot of fun the first few years and my friends would come out and harvest zucchini with me you know we were 23 24 and they're like oh yeah after work I'll come and so you know now the the farm is like quite structured uh which is important and to be at the scale we're at it needs to be the way it is but there's pain in in growing a farm but there's a lot a lot of joy as well and I think I wish I could remember that the other thing for me is there was a conference this year and you know we've done so many of these online conferences but I I don't actually remember where this one came from but it was a farmer in Washington and uh, she talked about the upward spiral I don't know if you're familiar with it but uh, yeah google up an image of it so it's uh it's called learn commit do and so it's just you know you keep doing it so you start with like the spiral is really small so it's called the spiral going up and opening up and so it's like you learn something you commit to doing something and then you do it. And I think one of the hardest things with farming is sometimes when you're doing experiments or trials, it takes a whole year to do it. And so you're always learning. Our neighbor, I asked him about blueberries one year and he's like, why are you asking me? I've only done it 10 times. You know, he's been growing blueberries for 10 years, his family. And, uh, you know, he's, he's only done 10 replications of it. And they're not even true reps because every year is different. And so I think sometimes we can get disheartened while we come up with this idea of how we want to do this growing season or how this crop to go. But every year we're learning and is just committing to do more and to learning more. And I think that has been, I, I have this little like picture beside my computer that I look at the upward spiral of learning, committing to actually doing it and then doing it and learning and just keep moving, like just keep learning. That's what the biggest thing is. And um, just getting excited about that. Cause sometimes I think it can be disheartening when things don't go the way you want them to, or you think on paper it was going to go, but there's still learning involved in that. It's like, okay, let's, let's figure out how to do it. Uh, You know, I learned this, let's keep moving. So yeah, not getting overwhelmed that things don't always work out the way it should, I guess. Yeah, no, I like that. I like the upward spiral much better than a downward spiral. That's for sure. So, <laughs> um, okay, where and how does wildness enter or influence your farming practice? So, we are on the Pacific Flyway. We have thousands and thousands of snow geese visit the farm. It enters everywhere all the time. It's what kind of pushes me. Uh, you know, the barn swallows just came back uh, a month ago and it's so exciting when they, they come back in the spring. And then in August, you wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, we have about three nests. We have a, about a hundred year old farmhouse and we have about three barn swallow nests on our house. And um, it's like, oh, they're still here. They're still here. And then you get to that day in August where you don't see them anymore. And then you just see one the next day. And then, you know, then there's none. And like, so I don't know. To me, the farm is so connected to nature. Uh, it helps so much with the seasonality. We're just one tiny part of this world as, as humans, and there's all this wildlife around us. So, yeah, we try to enhance the wildlife on the farm as much as we can with hedgerows, beneficial flowers. My my partner's a, a, a wildlife biologist, so um, we, yeah, we try to bring in nature as much as we can. But, yeah, t- utterly in awe of it. The marsh is right beside our farm. So getting out there, you know, it takes five minutes to walk out to the marsh and, and see all the, the true, you know, wild, wild lands around us. But yeah, it, it plays a big part of, of the farm and, and making sure we take care of it. You know, we're just, yeah, as I said, there's, there's so many more animals uh, that use the farm as their home. We're only one, one part of it. So yeah, no, I like that. That's beautiful. A, a very visual um, description. What do you long for and how does that influence how you farm? I guess connection. And maybe maybe that goes back to the last question, connection to the land and the wildlife. Uh, so when we make decisions, just being aware that there's other animals using the farm, uh, connection to our customers, 
So the way that we market direct, so we have that relationship, connection with our staff, you know, communicating a lot, making sure that this is a great, you know, hopefully this is a great place for them to work and working kind of on our, our, our workplace culture. That's what I yearn for is connection with people, place. And I guess I feel that food is a way to do that. It feels very connected to the place that we farm. And finally, how will you grow old farming? Yeah, I I hope that's it. And I kind of mentioned earlier is that if maybe one day I won't grow old farming, maybe I'll make the decision in 10 years, five years, uh, you know, 30 years that this there's there's something else that I'd rather be doing. So having that flexibility that that maybe I, I won't grow old farming and, and making that not be a scary thing. At this point, I think we only have one chance at this life. Uh, maybe not. But if this isn't serving me, then then moving on is okay. I, I certainly hope that I'll be doing this. You know, and uh, yeah, I certainly hope I'll be farming. There's things like climate change. I mentioned we're at sea level. I don't know if we'll be farming in this place. Like it, it's quite romantic to plant a tree and to see it grow and, and hopefully be here, but also maybe we have to pack up and move, move elsewhere to start farming. But I guess, sure. At this point, I would love to grow old farming. I would love to, to, you know, be physically moving my body, harvesting veggies, hopefully helping the next generation. And hopefully that's my children um, or somebody who uh, wants to maybe not children to take over um, the farm. But yes, I, I do hope to, to, to be on this farm. Yeah, no, that that's a that's a hard question and a very honest answer. So I appreciate that. Well, good. Well, Lydia, thank you so much. This has been really, really lovely conversation. It's so great to learn about you and your farm and your family and everything that you're doing. You've really accomplished so much in a relatively short amount of time. And I think you have so much wisdom to offer too. So I hope to meet you one day and I hope you come visit here too. So yeah, I really appreciate it, Clara. And and thank you for you taking the time to interview fellow farmers. It's always a great way to connect and, and learn from those kind of all, all around the world. So I, I, I appreciate uh, what you do. Thank you. Today's show was produced by me, Clara Coleman, with support from No-Till Growers. Special thank you to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you to the patrons at patreon.com slash no-till growers for helping to make this show possible. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week.